This is one of the best interviews that I've seen in a long time. I thought the record label was going to try to kill him at one point. He was selling direct mm. to consumer first. Like, once we went independent, then I understood, like, okay, this is how we're going to really get to the money. You sign with a record label doesn't mean that you're going to make any more money than you would have as an independent do it, right? You can make significantly more money. Hey, what's good, fam? I'm Tommy Music Attorney. This is one of the best interviews that I've seen in a long time. This is about the music business. If you are interested, this is one that you need to invest some time in to watch. I run a record label. I'm an independent artist. I also run a law firm and I've been lawyering for over 10 years. So I can tell you with all of that experience, this is one of the best interviews. You want to watch it. So without further ado, smash that like button and let's go. Today's <laughs> guest. I literally think it's the smartest person we've probably ever had on Drink Chat. <laughs> the fact that I've heard that he went to Harvard at 15 years old, graduated at 19, mm -hmm. had his own had his own platform. I thought I thought the record labels was going to try to kill him at one point. He was selling direct <laughs> to consumer first. He was giving out his phone number. He mm -hmm. He's doing concert where he's selling the tickets. Mm -hmm. It's this man is a, a mogul. This man is a legend, writer, producer everything. I've been trying to give this man his flowers, and today we're going to give him his flowers in case you don't know who the fuck we talking about. We talking about the one, only, impeccable Riley! Let's go, let's go. Music producer, artist, entrepreneur. Yeah. Now, the first and the fifth person to ever do something is always that risk taker, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the reward is worth it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that you 360 to yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's essentially you should, like, like right. just think about it. Clients ask me that because I go, sign yourself, become your own record label, right? So learn to think like a label, but literally become a label. And they go, well, does that mean I have to sign myself? And I go, yes, quite literally. You're going to sign yourself. Well, you control your own merch. Mm -hmm. You control your, your when, when I found out that you were selling the tickets direct to yeah. your shows, mm -hmm. it's, it's smart, but mm -hmm. that's a lot of work. So yeah. are you physically doing that? Yeah, so the way that we've had to do it, uh -huh. Like, let's just say we, we're going to do a venue in New York. We at, The venues have deals with Ticketmaster or right. whoever the vendors are. So we buy out all the tickets and then we are the we are we are our own resellers. So when people come in and, and get the tickets, we say we can say, yo, the whole venue sold out already. But that's because I can just go. If it's an 800 seater, I'm still doing, you know, right. theater size seater, right, 800 right. seater. Bang, we get all the tickets and then people text in and we just send them a, a QR code. Amazing. And guys, I did a whole video on this talking about how Ticketmaster, Live Nation, like they are monopolizing the live performance arena and they're forcing all of these fees. And so we went into like a deep dive about how this works. But I mean, Ryan Leslie's like, I don't care how it works. He goes, we're literally just going to go buy all the tickets and we're going to sell them ourselves. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're buying them from Ticketmaster. Yes. At a wholesale rate or regular? Well, we bought we bought it because we want the we want the the stats that right. we we sold oh, so, out. So you're right. also buying the stats by buying yeah. all the tickets. So yes, now exactly. On the books, sold out already, yes. and then you could do whatever you want with yes, it through exactly. your system. Exactly. Well, how, let me ask you: How about like states like Miami? Like states like Miami became like a new New York. What I mean is, mm -hmm. they're not impressed by nothing. Right. Like you and so it's like <laughs> right. Y'all know this. Y'all know how foul y'all all out here. Right. They ain't impressed. <laughs> they all know this, right? So. But this is this is a this is like a, a market, like they come out if they want to. What happens if you if you 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 buy out mm -hmm. and then only fifty percent? Do you lose money? No, nah, we we always have. Okay, you know our average. process. Our process is a reservation. Okay, so we'll say, hey, look, we're going to do one night only. Right. Miami, for right. example. Right. And we'll say, hey, look, if you're interested. Reserve and tell me how many tickets you want to I reserve. Text it, I keep forgetting. So they, okay. they they come in, they fill out a little form, they say, yo, I want five tickets, I want two VIPs, etc. We already know before, before we go the to the up. venue, right. and we might actually say, yo, we need a bigger venue. Okay, mm. we right. got our, our reservations is crazy right now. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? All right, so for us, right, the way that we're going to do the same thing, we're going to get a list of all the people who want to come to the show. And so maybe we have an idea of what the interest is. And this goes for like if merchandise, if you're selling merchandise, before you go and print the 100 t-shirts, you put out a post and you go, hey, if you want to be on the list and you want a certain size, let me know. And so you get an idea of who has said that they're going to purchase ahead of time, smart. It's nuanced. At the same time though, it's a very simple 
uh, let's call it, it, it's just a very simple sort of transition to the information age. Right. If we're in the information age, we should be making decisions based on information, right? right? Based on information and data. So if you have a means to collect that information and data, then your decisions are just going to be better. Business-wise, you're, you're never going to be holding the bag on anything, right? Yep. And so that's that's the reason why, even if you think about brand new artists that are coming out trying to do merch, now they have just on-demand printing. So mm -hmm. you don't have to go buy 70, 90, 100 right. T-shirts. Right. You just say, hey, look, this is the logo that I want. Right. This is what it looks like. And then through your e-commerce store, they will only print and ship yeah, what has no been ordered. Or Right, what you do is they use a platform like Threadless. They'll help you set up a store, so you just set up an account, you pay nothing. They will do order fulfillment, they have all of the products, you just tell them what you want printed on the products, your fans can come and purchase, and it's a good way to test the market and to see what people want. Now the downside is that if a company like this is doing all the work, they're gonna take the majority of the profits. But you A, can get a store set up immediately, and B, you can test to see what your fans actually want. If you're like, oh, they love our standard band black shirt, that's the one that we're gonna print, that's the one that we're gonna sell at our shows. A Music Attorney is your number one legal resource for artists, producers, and record labels. Get contract templates, one-on-one -on -one legal advice, free master classes, and everything you need for your music business. Go to tommusicattorney.com. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so we're getting better and better and better and more efficient at being able to allow creative minds to build enterprise around themselves. And and I think, you know, it's there's there's I, I think there's no better time to actually be an entrepreneur than right. than 2024 and beyond. I think I think a Love lot that. of people have an issue processing the analytics of things to understand it the way you might understand. Not everybody has that knowledge to say, okay, this is what these analytics mean and this is how I equal it to this marketing plan or yeah. execute it this way. Yeah, but I, I, I would say this, you're, you're only as good as your crew. Right. And if you're the creative in the crew, Bring in then you, you, can't, you can't say component, like, right. yo, I'm gonna be the 360 everything. Right, right. In some cases, maybe, you right. know, you, you're just like, oh, you, you, you have extra hours in the day and you, you, you can do four hours of music and four hours of data analytics. Mm -hmm. But you have to think this industry, the creative industry, whether it's film, whether it's podcast, whether it's YouTube. Whether and I would actually say 80-20 is how you need to treat it. 20% of what you're doing should be for the creative until you have things going, until you can bring people in. You have to be dedicating 80% towards the marketing, towards the business plan, towards looking at the analytics. If you don't do that, then you are shooting in the dark and you're shooting yourself in the foot. Whether it's influencing, whether it's music, you have so many people that are magnetically attracted to this industry. They wanna be around it, mm -hmm. but they're not creative. Right. They are the analytic. They are the analytical person. They are the management person. They are the operations person. And it's just, once again, I think it's just about putting the bat signal out and saying, look, I want the greatest of the great to be around. If you think what I'm doing is great, right. I want the greatest of the great around me yeah. and you build that team. And until that happens, be willing to do everything yourself. If you do everything yourself, then you have no excuses for not getting something done because you learned how to do it yourself. And then eventually you bring someone in to take that position. Now, when you um, open up this site, did you take your music off of Spotify and um, iTunes? Yes. And now, do you, do you think, now you, that same music you put back on yes. your platform, do you think that helps or, or hurts you? I think it helps. It helps? And, and the reason for it is because when you really, you know, at the very okay. beginning, it was more about doing the experiment. Right. Because we needed to do it, the experiment, make sure it works. And, right. you know, these are the type of conversations I was having with Nip. Nip uh -huh. did his Proud to Pay. Yeah, I heard Nip did it with yeah, you. Yeah, um, he, he did Proud to Pay. Yeah, exactly. Well, how did you guys talk about how you guys connected? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Know you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. And really, that's, that's, that's got to be through, through, through my guy, Nathan McCartney. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> if you haven't even been noticing what Nate has been doing, he has an Instagram profile called The Bag. It's crazy data uh -huh. analytics about the music business and everything. Um, if you check the followers of that page, it's like some of the who's who in, I'm talking about music, film, investment, et cetera. But he's always wanted, been one of these guys that's had his ears to the ground and was one of the first guys that, that, that um, worked with me on Superphone as well. But he actually was the one that put me with Nip. With Nip, so let yeah. me ask you, I know we're bouncing around, all yeah. over, but we're going to cover all grounds. Um, he comes to you and says, I want to sell a, a, a tape for $1,000? 
Yeah, yeah, and basically you didn't think he was out of his mind. Nah, because he had already he had already done the um, hundred dollar one. one. That's right. right. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I forgot That's that the one part. that Jay bought a thousand of them. I think. Yeah, the first, the yeah, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. Jay bought a thousand of the. No, nah, he bought a hundred. So it was, it was okay. yeah. So yeah, okay. that was the screenshot. The ten bands, a hundred right. Right, right. albums wow. at a hundred dollars. Ten bands, right? Okay, right? Yeah. So wow. so he had already done that, but he said, "Yo, Ry, listen, you know." Um, I've I've been looking at what you were doing. Like we just sat down and compared right. notes, and right. I said, "Hey, look, I'm gonna be honest with you. If you allow folks to actually give you what they believe is worth to them, mm -hmm. and you don't put the price on it, then there will be some folks that will come through and say, "Hey, I think your music has yes, has will. changed my life. Yes, it got me through." Whatever, I've had folks come to me, and it, actually, this is for any artist. Yo, your song got me through a breakup. Your song got me through mm -hmm. cancer. Your song got me through whatever it was. And to them, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. So if they have it, they'll give it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put a cap on what you think it's worth, hey, it's worth $12, then yeah. I was showing him in my super phone, hey, I got folks that have spent 25, five grand, you know, 15,000, 25,000 with me. He's like, yo, <laughs> off a $12 album, and I say, yeah, because once you build a relationship, they'll tell you what they want in terms of what's premium. And artists think too small. Music producers think too small. They don't think that there's someone out there that values their song, their EP, their album at $5,000, at $25,000. And that's what actually would give you that money because they appreciate what you're doing so much. There's so much integrity with artists in general. And I think that people feel funny asking and they think of this as I am asking or I'm begging my fans to give me money and that's not what it is you just make available there's a difference in the same kind of way we make our music available on Spotify and music platforms you can make a decision that you're making your music available and you're making the option available for people to pay you something out of their appreciation it's kind of a weird thing for a lot of artists and so when he was putting the whole package together it wasn't just yo here's the cd for a thousand right. you got to go to a show or you know yeah. some uh, got a phone call whatever it was um package and deal. i say yo man let's do it and you have the app and you got all the data and you'll know every single person where they live and their zip code and then you know what i'm saying and you can actually show them your appreciation for their support is all this stuff that you did and then even what you're describing here pre Patreon? Because this sounds like the Patreon model. Yeah, it was pre-Patreon. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I said it in your intro. It's like yeah. you're a real threat to the industry because if, if, if they have more of you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what are they needed for? Listen, I, I'll... You're putting everyone out of I mean, a job. So you, ever, you ever got nervous? Spot. I never worry about that for the simple reason that when it's your time, it's just your time. All right. And you have to do the most that you can with the decades that you have right. and we really right. only get right. three four right. if we talk about decades right. you know what i'm saying <laughs> and we luck if we get three or four of right. them you know what i'm saying so you have to do the most that you can with the decades that you have and i and if i if i really think about it some of the artists that so he's not he's not even sitting here so far he's been just so positive and i love this the people who alleviate the negativity in their framework and just being like the music business is over nothing is working it's so hard to get fans if you think through this you manifest more of it if you think of your career through this framework you manifest more of this negativity and so with ryan leslie he goes well i don't really know what's going on with everyone else this is just what i'm doing this is what's working and he goes also i'm just so grateful for like what i have because you don't have this forever. You don't have this opportunity to create. This is such a great interview. We still revere to this day. There's this concept of like the artist age of reckoning where like some of our greatest were all gone by like 20... Eight. Tupac, Big, both yeah, four. yeah, you know what I'm saying, and so they did what they had to do with the time that they had. So for me, I'm like, yo, I've, I've had plenty of decades, you know, right. and so if what I'm able to do is plant the seeds, whether it's plant the seeds for like you said, a Patreon or, uh, you know, any of the Superphone competitors that have come out, right? And clones that have come out right. or plant the seeds for the next artist to be able to know what to do with their money, how to do it with their money the right way. I think, you know, there there is uh, there is a possibility to actually have a like a real creative <laughs> middle class, right? Because, you know, for me and, and going back to the beginning of the conversation, for me, going to Harvard, and then saying, I want to be in music every- Oh yeah, that's right. So he all went to Harvard. I really appreciate all the points that he's making because even in literally saying that people have ripped off what he has done, he goes, 
you know, basically these infringers, he's not even angry about it. He goes, I'm glad I planted the seed for someone else to come on and do something that made them money. Everyone just assume I was going to be broke. Right. Just assume. They just say, yo, you want to be creative, you want to be in the arts, you're going to be starving for a long time. You may, you might, might just get that break where you, you're the one percent that actually gets on. But I think it, as you're talking about, if you understand how the data works, uh -huh. as Nip was talking about, you understand how to connect with that core group. It doesn't matter even if it's just a product that's not music. Even if it's just a, you know, you're you're starting a coffee brand, you're starting a liquor brand, whatever, yeah. you find that core group and you can appeal to them, they will be loyal. And I think it allows for there to be an actual creative middle class where you can actually, and it's tough though, because that's almost like a, that's almost like an oxymoron. And I'm gonna yeah. tell you why, because most folks, when they think creative, they don't want to be middle class. You, it's like it's like when when mm -hmm. Ye said, you know, what you think I rap for to try? To, <laughs> right? Right. That's not what you're right. doing it for. Right. But the bottom line is that if you're doing what you love to do, if you can earn a is, living, any, what, if you can, yeah, right. if you can earn a living doing what you love to do, you made it. How valuable is you that? You made it. You made it. How it valuable is yeah. that? You know. And if you take away this idea that you need to have this glamorous life, and you know, I say this, I go, you know, as a law firm owner, I represent clients who make, let's say $10,000 a month, easy, with what they're doing as music producers, as singers, right, as performers, and they might not have millions of followers or millions of streams on Spotify, but they're actually making way more money than a major artist who is signed and does have millions of plays on Spotify. And so it's really just understanding like, what kind of artist do you want to be? What's the point of what you're doing? And I think if you shift that framework, you'll stop getting down on yourself. When you go to your Instagram, you're like, that last post that I posted do you know, doesn't have 10 million likes on it. Therefore, I'm a failure. And that's just not true. You know what I'm saying? And so really for me, I think really that's, that's the crusade that I'm on. So I'm not worried about, you know, if it's my time or, you know, all the greats, the greatest of the great, their, their impact was even more exponentially increase by the fact that, you know, they, maybe they folks felt that they were gone too soon. Right, like Martin. Well, you talk about Martin, you talk about X, you talk about Bob Nipsey, Marley. you talk about Bob Marley, you talk about Pac, you t yeah. because Jimi Hendrix, the body of work that they have, that's all you got. And right. then you start realizing, man, to be that age yeah. and be talking like that, playing like that, thinking like that, you know what I'm saying? Right. And it, it sets the bar for, for us that are actually still here. We still here, so we better be right. continuing to push. You know what I'm saying? Major so or good. independent? <laughs> Major or independent? Yeah. Independent. Okay. Your first two albums was on Motown, correct? Yes. This is, this is, this is me being straight spoiled. It was hard for me to go from a major mm -hmm. to independent because I like the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. I like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. these other shits. And when I went from major mm -hmm. to independent, mm -hmm. I had to downgrade. I don't know if that's the right world, but but mm -hmm. yeah, but <laughs> it is. It is. Damn. What? All right, yeah, but I had to uh, downgrade. Your mind, it was, yeah. Yeah, like it was. It, it was, I had to go yeah. back to the Sheraton. Uh, but but it's, <laughs> it, it was completely different for me. I, I had. Right. Like, I wasn't a right. multi-platinum. Like, right. I had, there was a lot of respect for the right. musicianship, but right. it wasn't like I was multi-platinum, billboard, number one hits, right. and, right. you know, records right. in clubs, and the hottest, et cetera, et cetera. No, so. but it looked like that to us, at least. It looked like that to us. I did a video recently on this where we just basically looked at the fact that a lot of artists are pretending. They're pretending to have the money, they have the flashy cars, they have the flashy jewelry, but really they're not making anything. And this goes back to, you really need to have a long-term investment plan for what you're doing. People think so short-term and they're just trying to get big numbers. But also if you sign with a record label, it doesn't mean that you're gonna make any more money than you would have as an independent. And in fact, as an independent, if you do it right, you can make significant more money in the music business. And you Maybe it looked like that, but I, I mean, to be frank, we sold 180,000 records the first. On Motown. And 60,000 on the second. Now, the second one, we got nominated for a Grammy, but that's right. I mean, right. that's a total of, I mean, that's, we, we didn't even, you know. And still. They didn't even recoup.
Probably. In the <laughs> era where you had to sell like crazy amount of records, yeah. like gold and, and so platinum. You literally, I heard you say this before, but you literally made more money off of your independent albums than you did. Now, is that is it, it entirety? It. How about the tours? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I didn't even tour off of those albums. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Understand what you're saying. So, like, once we went independent, then I understood. Like, okay, this is how we're gonna really get to the money, because right. that's I think what's so opaque. It's very opaque when you're a major label. You're right. at the major label. Things are paid for. Right. Studios paid for. Advances paid for. Right. Travel is paid for, etc. But then once the sales come in, unless you reach a certain amount, you gotta wait till your next album budget opens up before you get paid and again. It's, it's a bank loan. I think yeah. you had eighty twenty your first it's deal or something like, something, like something like that. And that's what I'm saying. It's just like you know, I, I for me, I don't like that opacity. I, I want to have. Full okay, transparency. I don't know what that word means. Say that again. <laughs> like, opacity. Yes, I want. Yes, yeah, so opaque. What does that mean? It's, okay, opacity. I gotta covered, use it. You know. So I want. <laughs> I, I, want, I, want I want. I want full transparency. Right. 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 And yeah, and I think I think that's so fair. The record labels really are glorified banks because they're giving you a loan. They're funding you to sign you. They're funding you to market the album, get you in the studio. And there's nothing wrong with you now owing the label. That's the deal. That's the contract that you signed. And so then the royalties that come in from the music go to pay back that loan. The one-to-one -one is always, well, what if you just did this yourself and you went to the bank and you took out a loan for $100,000 and now you're responsible for what happens with that money. So there's the treating it as a loan because it is a loan, but then you have the second piece of a record label that has no interest in ha giving full disclosure and detailed statements of what it's doing with these accounts. It doesn't want to deal with the artists and the artist questions. So they're just going to send a little, hey, just letting you know, your royalty for this month was like $12 or you didn't get paid because you're unrecouped. And so that was quote unquote, none of my business. You yep. know, how much did they make, you know? Uh, and so that's why I really wanted to go independent because I was like, yo, if we sold 180,000 records the first time, how did I only sell? We're in the information age. How did I only sell 60,000 the second time? We should and just email everybody who bought the first. is that just US sales? Because they, they could have did that. And like you said, they didn't give you the information. So, so what he just said, he goes, we could have just emailed everyone who bought the first album. Why did only 50% purchase and that goes to if you are an entrepreneur and you are in the music business taking this seriously you're gonna think about numbers like that you go i don't know what kind of marketing campaign did the label do and most artists won't know because you're not included in those conversations maybe you, you sold because we were saying the records everywhere so we had mm. to maybe they I, I i truly believe man i think that the records were favorites amongst artists. Okay. Well, so if artists were sending around, yo, you heard uh, Ryan's joint, uh, et cetera, uh, they were favorites. But when I went to Germany, I was not on the radio in Germany. Everything was on little mixtapes. People were spinning it in clubs, et cetera. But there was that real groundswell of people that's like, yo, I like this music, you know? Uh, I, I remember me, um, asking for like accounting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they telling me that the record label was saying, oh yeah, we spent, 500 grand in mm -hmm. Japan, and we spent 250,000 mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Dusseldorf, Germany, and we spent, yeah. we spent this in- and Only in Dusseldorf, though. Right. You, know, you know Dusseldorf is my favorite place. That's the only place right. yeah. right. you know, right. yeah. you know, I go to Hamburg, Frankfurt, and all that, you know, Berlin and all that, you know? I've been around quite some time. But what I'm trying to say is, when they did that to me, I couldn't, like, it was, I don't know, I don't want to say it wasn't ordered in back then. Yes. I just didn't know about it. Right. And there was no way for me to, there was no Instagram. So if they right. said they had a, a, a a poster of me right. in Japan. I had to just take well, it. Well, we know yeah. now that they were scamming everybody that way. Right. Yeah, for real? Yes, the marketing <laughs> budgets were all, they were, they were siphoning money like, like a motherfucker. This is proven, this is proven, yeah. I got caught. But this, is why, this, is why, but this is why you love the majors because the era that you were in was when the record labels were flush with cash. So they didn't make you pay back. They would be like, cool, they would let you off your car. It's still whatever. flush with cash, though. Let's not, let's but not I mean, get it was, twisted. It was crazier back then. Mm -hmm. That's so a record mm -hmm. off of CDs. Mm -hmm. I love Those margins I love back that then. Era. This, like, I love, this is, me yeah. and him argue all the time because he's a, he's a super independent guy. Which, right. I just think that independent, if you want to go to major, be independent first so you can leverage and have a better deal. 100%. 100%. 
If you're gonna go to a major, if that's what you want, cool. I'm the attorney that's gonna help you with that, but you gotta leverage it. What is your bargaining power if you're gonna walk in and say, hey, I want a deal and not have them take complete advantage of you? I'm a machine. You know See, I feel the opposite. And you, you, you tell me, mm -hmm. I feel like you should be go major first. Let them spend that budget on you because yes. they can't ever take back your fame. Yes. It's not like that now. In his era, it was. Now, they're accounting for every penny. Well, I'm not a dinosaur, yes. man. Like, what do you mean? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it 900 years ago? But it, but but in, in the terms of the record business, it was. Yeah, <sighs> what, what I'm saying, though, is I agree. If somebody else is going to spend the money to make you famous, yeah. oh, and then you can actually leverage that and That's make sure crazy. you do it the right way. And yeah. you can come out whole. Yes. But now, a lot of these artists aren't coming out whole. They're stuck in that now. And these I deals. Don't know what you mean. I'm definitely more along the mindset of back in the day, record labels will pluck you out of obscurity and they make you a big star. They don't do that anymore. Now they're looking for artists that already have some buzz. They already have a fan following. They have music that is doing well. And then they pour the gas on the fire. And so, you know, to the point, the argument of just being like, well, you know, yes, it's a loan, but the label takes that risk. You don't have to pay back these loans personally. It's just a risk related to your music. Your music is now owned by the record label. You're probably not going to get paid anything because they're in the process of recouping. So there is an argument that, okay, sign with a label. Hopefully they do a great job. Hopefully they have that investment, make you a big star. But I always say, what happens when they don't? And they still own your music and you gave up all your rights. Well, no, no, no. They're well, they're deal. stuck. So they, they can't. Money, they they haven't recouped. Oh, yeah, they and can't. Oh, you talking about stuck with the record label? Then you could not recoup, and they were doing well. The labels, they could have had a, liked you as an artist. Be like, cool, yeah, no problem, and we'll let you out your deal. Or let this person buy you out your deal. Like they were making deals left and right. I don't think as Nori, I never recouped. Come on, mm. Noriega, I did. Mm -hmm. As Nori, I spent so much money. I mean, like. I wanted to. Nori signs today. He's signing a 360 <laughs> deal where the name Noriega or Nori is it's copyrighted by them. the label. Yeah. And when you don't recoup, you can't use that name. You better go on as Sir Francis Jr., <laughs> the MC <laughs> out there. And make, make a living, buddy. Oh, man, let's get back to quick time. <laughs> <laughs> they got spooky. But even though these labels are crumbling as, as we see them right now, I think the tech companies are the new record labels. I and they're the ones yeah. I think his, I think your idea, period, is a new record label for those no, that I'm talking about the bad guys. I'm, when I say the bad, right. but the bad imagine, guys. Imagine now, imagine we take your concept, that concept, right? And now you showing people, you listen, you was, because even when you was dropping independent, it looked like you was major. Oh, because we, we, I mean, we I watched were you in the Breakfast Club and I yeah. seen you. We were, mo we were moving that way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, Which is, but that's the other piece of it is it requires also the financial infrastructure right. because otherwise like if you can make a hundred grand pay four thousand dollars a month forever then that means you can make a million dollars pay forty thousand dollars a month right. forever right right so that's really once you have both the business infrastructure and the financial infrastructure then it becomes an infinite loop right. and that infinite loop is really what that's really what an artist needs to be able to say, like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, mm. I want to go record my next album in, in in France somewhere. You know, like the Rolling Stones did it. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, he's saying if you don't understand the music business, or better yet, if you ha understand the music business and you have a music plan, you can put forth a way to pay for your dreams. You don't need a label. You don't need anybody else. You just need to understand what you're doing and actually have a business plan. I think you being as smart as you are, right? You having this early idea that's fucking genius. We all know we all know it's genius, and we all know if, if it works, when it works, mm -hmm. how a art, the artist can benefit off of this. Mm -hmm. Right now, radio is still important, right? I told this to Fat Joe the other day. I was like, yo, if I was to ever drop a record again, you're going to work by radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like him. Like, right, yeah. no, I, don't, I don't want you to hire somebody, mm -hmm. Joe. Yeah, I want yeah. you. You mm -hmm. know you know every PD. Mm -hmm. He's put in mm -hmm. 20, 27 mm -hmm. to more years. Right. He put and in that work. Mm -hmm. where, where Joe has to fight. He, he did it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the future. Like, mm -hmm. when... The concept that you have mm -hmm. for artists working for other artists and artists are saying, I, oh, I always love Violator for that. Mm -hmm. Violator was like artist managing yes. artists. Yes. Chris Lighty was like an artist. Team. Yeah. And that's why I think this is going. Like, I know it's sounding so minute, 
But I feel like Fat Joe will be running ahead of the radio department. See how he just dropped the record just now? And the shit just went yeah. through, 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 through yeah. everywhere. It was yeah. everywhere. I, uh, not because he's my friend. This shit was just everywhere. And I'm like, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. I think eventually we're going to hire ourselves right. to do to do the work on your platform. You think it's going to go that we're way? We're going to hire let me, ourselves. Let me speak to your assistant. I, I, I would like to see that. that would be dope. What, what, I, what I will say, though, is just as you said, there will be other iterations of platforms for folks to actually communicate with their fans. Yeah. Right. I think the money piece is more of an issue because the money piece is what people, even like you said, when we started this conversation, you said, oh, I didn't know there was something that could do that, yeah. right? And so I feel as though, for me, even moving from music to technology is because I felt like I could serve a wider tranche of the population. Trosh? Trosh. <laughs> Just go with it, man. Just go with it. I've been Googling you know, all day. Never yeah. mind. Okay. Right. So, so <laughs> He's I think... He's got the spread. I, I think, yeah, I, th I think now you're right. right. But the, the ability for money management from the concept of what artists really like. Because we, like you said, we like the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. We like the, you know, if we can, if we give ch fly charter, we like to fly charter. Right. If we could go vacation, we could go on a destination recording. We'd rather do that than the bedroom recording, right? One of the things that they're talking about is this tech company model, right? But what I call it is the media label. The new record labels that are doing well, right, are media labels it's not that music is the only thing music is very important when you have a music label but if we now think a little more globally to it's all of media it's the video aspect it is the live performance and the media that we see as part of those live performances it's the digital assets that we are streaming that we are licensing now you are thinking about actually monetizing everything that is created including social media content so it's about how do you work the finances to be able to deliver that. And that's why I think, like you said, when we when we were doing independent albums, we still yeah, look, 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 I swear to God, yeah. I, I, I thought you were still on a major. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like me and him always argue mm -hmm. that. And it's like, yo, you know what? Let's take the best of both worlds and mix it together. Yeah. And I think that's what this is. Like for us to make independent money, yes. but to look like a major, like, look like yes. a major is backing it. Because yes. then you lose nothing. Yeah. You you actually gain everything. Yeah. It's like, and I believe that this is a big and, and to be I able believe to, you, you you struck you struck to stand struck, struck it. to stand on your own independently and and strike strategic partnerships with whatever major entities. Yeah. That's the that's really the goal because the, that's where a lot of the you could get a lot of financing yeah. from. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Doing deals. It, started... yeah, and and that's what we talk about. Like so we have Kesha starting her own record label and then doing a distribution deal with ADA versus signing with a record label, right? So she retains ownership of her music. She has discretion creatively. She has oversight of things like marketing and budgets that are being spent. And so you do that because again, you walk in with negotiation power and you now are partnering with a big company, like a record label, again, as a partner. Cut you off, think about it. When you're doing it on your own, and if you don't show up to the radio station, it all gets on you. Yeah. But now if you have somebody who's professional in that position, it's like yeah. you don't, you're don't. you still independent, mm -hmm. but you got somebody else helping and saying, yo, listen, we got to make it to Cosmic Cab at 5 p.m. Yeah. He's going to pull our record if we don't yeah. do it. <laughs> if you have somebody who has that experience, I think, why wouldn't you do that? I yeah. think that's the only thing that that's missing from this beautiful mm -hmm. idea. It's like, you know what? It might be really us running us. And when I yeah. say us, I don't mean race. Right. I mean the people that's a part of the culture. Right, you right. understand what I'm saying? It's, like, it's important. Yeah, it's, it's important. important. I think we should make some noise for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I had a moment, had a moment, had a moment. Because before when I said about the, the tech industries taking over the music industry, what is your take on that? Like how everybody's kind of vilifying the Spotify's and all the DSP's, like, what do you think? It's necessary. I, th I think- I They're think, a necessary I, evil? I or? believe that this, a symbiotic relationship between the creativity and the technology is necessary. And it, it will take several iterations until it will be perceived as fair. But I believe like, you know, that there, there was no other way to go than a Netflix or a Spotify. Right, but do you just like it's all the entire library of all recorded music yeah, is in wild. my device right now? Well, the library of humanity is in your yeah, hand right now. But that, but that's what I'm saying. So, it's 
it, it's inevitable. And it's almost like how people are, they might want to vilify AI, but it's inevitable. And so you were just, we were just talking about motif versus, right. you know, um, phantom. But when you think, or Stevie Wonder, the guy Ray Kurzweil, who made the Kurzweil synthesizer, he's a, a you know, a, a super forward thinker on what's called technological singularity, where you won't be able to tell right. the difference between mm. a human and a and, an, and a robot at some point. He believes that at some point yeah. it's going to converge. Yep. And so that's why you have a neural link from Elon Musk or whatever, like he will put a chip or, and it's like, okay, you either assimilate or do you, you know, at some point there are folks that are gonna say, hey, I don't want the chip in my child. But then does that mean that your child is now gonna be behind all the other kids that have a chip, right? So at some point yeah. there is going to have to be some sort of, of um, you know, convergence. And it's about us as, as, a, as a race, as a species, understanding how we do that in the safest way possible. But putting yeah. your financial cap on, don't you think that the conversation should be have because these we're seeing it in real time. The DSPs are making an incredible the amount from, of money. From Spotify just got 365 million. Yeah. Billions, and they're making billions. billions. I mean, yeah. 365. Yeah. Off of, you know, it, because obviously the model is that now anybody could be an artist and feed that model. Yeah. And it, and you know and, and, it, and it generates income, but and I wonder if Ryan Leslie is going to come back and just talk about his direct to fan model, where he has now put everything on his own platform, right? So again, I think of DSPs as an opportunity for marketing. It's not necessarily where you need to ha you know live and die with your music only on that platform because that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense for you to spend money and time and effort into creating something that you then essentially just put out onto Spotify for free. If you don't have a plan beyond that, you need to get one. And is there a way for your fans to purchase your album, purchase your single, purchase your EP in advance to get some kind of signed version on, let's say, some key card that's a USB to build the relationship so you can get contact information, so you can take ownership of your audience. So to his point, if we sold 160,000 units, of a certain album, we should do substantially the same amount on the next album. And if we don't, why not? But that's exactly what I'm saying. At some point, through different iterations, we will get to a relationship that is fair and equitable. But in the early stages, he who controls the cash flow controls how the actual pie is divided. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. And right now, as 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 so, artists, so you're optimistic that it will pan out. It's inevitable, okay. in my opinion. Like Snoop Dogg, I believe he's the first one that said, to say how unfair these these music splits are. Yeah. He's, he's he's the one at that status, but a lot of people have been saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I believe he's the first one I saw. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely at that status that was willing to step up. There actually is no better feeling than being helpful to someone. Right. And and I'm yes. telling you, just something as simple as you know. If, if just imagine how you would feel if you know you in line in a Starbucks or somebody somebody says you know what I actually what 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 are you ordering I got you it's something as simple as yeah, that yeah, yeah. but on the flip side if you're the person who's able to do that that gives you that kind of that kind of uh, positivity that you're able to do something for someone and so I think really there's two parts. Has anyone, leave, leave a comment down below if you've ever had this happen. There was like a trend years ago and it was the buy someone in line at Starbucks uh, a coffee. And so I ended up having one of those. So someone bought my drink and then, you know, obviously you have no obligation to do anything after that, but you didn't pass it on and you buy and you pay for, or wait, would it be the other way around? Yeah, no. So the person in front of you pays for the person behind you anyway. But I like what he's saying. It feels amazing to make other people feel amazing and to be the source of that good feeling. Take care of yourself so that you're in a position to be helpful and of yes. service to folks. Right. So yes. it, obviously if you're taking care of yourself, you're gonna feel great, right? It's like the plane mask. Right. You gotta put it on yourself first before right. you even help your kids. And then number two, right. actually be in that spirit of service because there is no greater reward than knowing that something that you've done is actually 
helpful to someone else. And I believe that not only is this something that he actually believes, it's his philosophy, but it's something that he applies to his music career because when you apply this to your music career, you start winning. When you think of your fans, when you're making content, it's not about you. It's not about your vanity. It's not about your highlight moments. It's about how can you make someone feel good for a moment and you can connect them with a song that you made, for example, or that ultimately you go, if I want to build a connection, a real connection with my fans, how do I do that? That means I have to make myself uncomfortable. I have to figure out a website. I have to set up an email list. I have to send these emails. I need to get an email list for my live shows and then type those into my Aweber. <laughs> it's tough. But if you are thinking about what is best for your fans, that's going to be the thing that makes you win, particularly with this direct to fan model that we keep talking about. That's why I have the optimism about music and technology. Right. That's why I have the optimism with, you know, if people are not making that much money in music or that much yeah. money, period. I have seen, literally, have seen folks who have taken, you know, mail carrier, commercial truck driver salaries and turned it to millions of dollars. And it's because they just need to know, it's middle school math, but somebody just With gotta show them. too, they had some discipline. Yeah, and they, have somebody, they got somebody that's gonna show them. Right. You know, and, and for me, I had someone to show me. So that's really what it's about for me. Ryan Leslie, one of the best interviews that I've seen in a really long time. Please drop a comment down below if you thought this was amazing. And quite frankly, I feel like I really need to do an interview with Ryan Leslie. So if someone knows him, please reach out to him. Send this to him. <laughs> Tell him we need to get him on the Top Music Attorney podcast. Guys, if you haven't yet, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. I'll see you on the next one. I'm Top Music Attorney.